What's up Guardians? Profane here. Thanks for checking out the video. Ghost of the Deep enters into the weekly dungeon rotation this upcoming week, which means the Navigator will finally be available to be farmed. So I figured it would be a good opportunity to do an updated guide on how anyone can easily solo and solo flawless the Ghost of the Deep dungeon during Season of the Wish. And this is coming from an average player, because I am nowhere near to the level of some of these guardians who can knock out an entire solo dungeon in less than 20 minutes. In fact, it takes me a couple of hours on these newer dungeons, and if I can do it, you can do it. If this is your first time jumping into Ghost of the Deep, you will need to have access to the Lightfall dungeon key to enter, and you'll need to visit Ikora Ray at the tower to start the quest. Soloing Ghost of the Deep has never been as easy as it is right now, with the addition of this season's artifact mods, which include Solo Operative, Argent Ordnance, and several Solar and Strand Oriented mods, you'll be able to beast through this dungeon with ease. With Solar Artifact mods like Rays of Precision, Kindling Trigger, and Flint Striker, you'll have a significant advantage when using Solar Weapons and Solar Builds this season. We are using a Strand Titan in today's footage. I found this to be more reliable to use in Ghost of the Deep, as Banner of War and Woven Mail provide much better survivability than Restoration and Cure. Along with every type of energy damage, there will be a lot of moths that will be chasing you down at every stretch of this dungeon. So having Arc Resistance, Concussive Dampener, and Emergency Reinforcement will be invaluable mods to use on your chest armor. The opening encounter of this dungeon requires you to unlock four hive seals that will open the doorway into the rest of the dungeon. These seals are protected by Lucent Hive, and you'll need to track down and bring back one at a time. These are scattered around the area, but your path will be made easily visible by the green goo that drops on the ground after defeating the ogre. As you follow the goo, you'll need to defeat each of the small groups of enemies, and continue to follow the goo until you've reached the Lucent Hive, who's carrying the vestige. You'll need to take note of what glyph you're tracking down, because when you return it, you'll have to deposit it into its corresponding post. If you put the vestige into the wrong depository, you'll die, and before depositing the vestige, you'll need to defeat the wizard who's guarding the depository, and you'll need to reveal the deep sight focus. Once you've deposited the fourth vestige, all the enemies will despawn, and the path forward will be unlocked.
and we now enter into an extensive maze that leads you through several waterway systems. There will be a few areas that enemies pop up, but none of these include any high ranking enemies, just small groups of enemies that are trying to get in your way. As you traverse through the maze and enter into the methane ocean, you'll need to be sure you're collecting the pockets of air so that you don't die while making your way through the water.
Now that you've made it through the maze, we're on to the first boss encounter against Ektar. This is a big, tanky Lucent Knight, and as you'll notice, this is a pretty small and confined area, which is why swords and shotguns will be the most effective source of damage. Shotguns with trench barrel and one-two punch will do very well against this boss. The Lament or the Tractor Cannon would be my recommended exotics to use. But if you are struggling to stay alive, I would recommend utilizing the Risk Runner since it provides damage resistance and an overshield when taking arc damage. There's also the Air Apparent Solar Machine Gun that will cast a shield around you as you hold in on the aim button. By design, enemies are never going to stop spawning during this encounter, even during damage phase. And since this is a closed in area, surrounded will become an extremely beneficial weapon trait that's going to help you deal more damage to Ektar. Before you can deal damage to Ektar, you'll need to defeat the Yellow Bar Knights and the Ogre that spawn in on the steps. After these enemies have been defeated, you'll need to activate the Deep Sight that's down at the fountain at the bottom level of the arena. After activating the Deep Sight, you'll notice that on the right and left walls, there are Hive symbols, and three of them are going to be lit up, identifying the Hive runes that you'll need to activate down in the water below. Once you've taken note of all three symbols, dive in and go find the runes. While you're searching for the runes, watch out for the boss, and be sure to collect pockets of air. Each time you activate a rune, a Lucent Wizard will spawn upstairs, but if you activate the wrong rune, you die. You'll need to defeat all three of the wizards and collect their vestiges. You'll have a limited amount of time to deposit each of these vestiges. And once you've collected the wizard's vestige, you'll need to deposit them into the statues on the second level of the arena. If you time it out right, you should have some extra time to use before having to deposit the third rune. So be sure to take some time to collect ammo, collect orbs, and try to build up any armor charges or any buffs that you may need this way they'll be active when you go into damage phase. Once the third rune has been deposited, damage phase will begin, but you'll need to first defeat the knight that just spawned in front of Ektar. Once this knight has been defeated, the knight will drop goo on the floor, and you'll need to stand in that goo while breaking Ektar's shield. You'll have to break Ektar's shield before you can begin doing actual damage, so be sure to hold off on using DPS supers and big boy damage for once his shield has dropped. You'll have 35 seconds to deal damage against Ektar, and after that damage phase is over, the whole process is going to rinse and repeat. So you'll have to defeat the Yellow Bar Knights and the Ogre, and then collect the Vestiges all over again before entering into another damage phase. To those who aren't hardcore tryhards, you're probably looking at 3 to 4 or maybe 5 damage phases to get this boss down, if not more. So to have the most success with this encounter, you'll need a reliable and continuous source of damage resistance, along with health recovery. And if you get into a pinch at any point, and you just need to lay low for a few seconds, you can always jump into the water, regain your health, calm the nerves, and get back at it. And sometimes you're going to find ammo bricks and orbs that have fallen down in the water.
after Ektar has been defeated, we're en route to another maze that's going to have us traverse through more waterways and then through a long corridor filled with wizards and shriekers. Once you're out of the water and have gotten to the long corridor, it'll be wise to have a weapon with some range so you can stay back and just pick off all the wizards and as many shriekers as you can from a distance. And now we're on to the final boss encounter against Samuma, Sam, Simamu, Simamoa, Samoa, against Simamua. I, I don't know. I don't know how to pronounce this one. Somebody go ahead and correct me in the comments below. This encounter can get intense, regardless of what the boss's name is. There's a ton of moths, tanky knights, lucent hive, and a boss that almost never stops shooting at you. And just like with Ektar, the enemies are never going to stop spawning which means weapons with surrounded will really be beneficial. There is one major issue with this boss, and I'm not talking about the time that it takes to activate Deep Sight, but this boss continues to float around, even during damage phase, and she'll teleport, making it much harder to utilize up-close weapons like shotguns, which is why we're using the Doomed Petitioner, a new linear fusion rifle that can drop with surrounded, and we're using that along with Arbalest, which is going to one-tap the boss's overshield. Alternatively, with Argent Ordnance equipped, rocket launchers like the Dragon's Breath or the Apex Predator will really be able to pack a punch. And just like with Ektar, the Risk Runner will be a great exotic to use, especially if you're having struggles surviving. This encounter incorporates similar mechanics as the previous ones did. To start the damage phase, you'll have to collect three vestiges and return them to their corresponding spots. But this time you're bringing the vestiges back to deposit into Oryx, into either his chest, his left or right hand, his left foot, right knee, or straight into his head. At the beginning of each phase, you'll have to activate the Deep Sight Focus, which is going to identify the three locations on Oryx that you'll need vestiges for. These change each phase, and the location of the Deep Sight Focus will change each time it's used. Once you've identified the three positions that need vestiges, you'll need to lure the yellow bar knights who have names into that area and defeat them while within the green rings that will be on the floor. But whatever you do, don't try to do the chest first because it never properly registers. And with that said, you'll find more often than not, getting that mechanic to work properly is easier said than done because sometimes even when the knight is within the green ring, it still doesn't count when you kill him. After each knight goes down, there will be a rune and a ring that appear in the sky, and you'll need to aim down sights through the ring and spot the rune to complete the process.
After all three spots are done, there will be a glyph that floats above the location, and you'll now need to track down the three vestiges that correspond to those glyphs, and you'll need to bring them back. This will need to be done one at a time. There are three waterways that lead out of the main arena and lead to caves where the Lucent Hive are hiding out and protecting the vestiges. There's one on the far left, one at the top, and one at the far right. You'll have to go through each pathway, defeat the Lucent Hive that's within the cave, take note of which glyph was in the room, and then come back to the main area as quickly as you can. You'll need to find the Deep Sight Focus before your Vestige Timer runs out. And once you've activated the Deep Sight Focus, you'll need to find the corresponding glyph that's on Oryx and dunk the Vestige. When it's time to activate the Deep Sight, you're probably going to have the boss shooting at you the whole time. So if possible, you want to try to have a barricade, a rift, or a healing grenade at the ready. After you've defeated all three Lucent Hive and returned all three Vestiges, damage phase will finally begin. Just like with Ektar, you'll need to stand within the goo at one of the Vestige locations in order to break the boss's shield. This is where the Arbalest will really come in handy as it has the ability of one-shotting the boss's overshield, allowing you to instantly move into the actual damage phase. Dealing damage from the chest does offer a little bit of cover, but it can also put you in a bad position once damage phase is over, so it might be in your best interest to do damage from Oryx's head. But once the boss's overshield has been popped, you can relocate to a better position. You'll have about 45 seconds to deal damage before having to rinse and repeat the whole process over again. And just like with Ektar, most of you will probably not be able to one or two phase this boss, so you really want to play it safe at all times, and you really want to have plenty of options for damage reduction and health recovery available between your weapons, armor, and through your class tree. If you do get in a pinch at any point during this encounter and are just too overwhelmed, you can retreat back into the water tunnels, giving you time to get health back, regain energies, and calm those nerves. And since the enemies will never stop spawning and there's no wipe mechanic, don't be afraid to use your super because it shouldn't take you long to get it back. Ammo economy will surely become an issue though, so having a high powered exotic primary like the Outbreak Perfected, the Wish Ender, or the Malfeasance will be great weapons to swap over to once your heavy ammo is depleted. And with that, I think we've covered just about all the ins and outs on soloing the Ghost of the Deep dungeon in Season of the Wish. 
I wish you all the best of luck out there. Let me know how your attempts of completing this dungeon are going and what builds you've found to be most beneficial. I will be leaving a couple of Destiny Item Manager links to a few different builds that might bring you some success when attempting this on your own. So be sure to check those out down in the description below. We're going to keep this footage going, but I want to thank you all for checking out today's video. If you enjoyed and found it helpful, then be sure to hit that like button below, along with the subscribe button if you're new. Both are greatly appreciated, and both really do help support the channel. If you're a new Light Guardian, just starting your journey, or a battle-hardened veteran just looking for a new home, then be sure to check out the Discord link in the description below and join one of the greatest communities in all of Destiny. And until next time, Guardians, this has been Profane, wishing you all some happy hunting.
resurrects the Taken King. By force. We're lucky you were able to stop this go. 